Hi all, my name is Tova Leiter and on behalf of the New York Film Academy, I'm excited about our guest tonight. You have read about his background as an agent, development executive and script analyst for Netflix. And tonight you will get first-hand pointers on how to navigate the streaming revolution. Let's welcome Michael Schulman. Hi, Michael. Hi, Tova. How are you? you? I'm excellent. <laughs> um, so we, you started, you have stint in your career as an agent at ICM and CAA and William Morris, all great, important agencies and as a development executive for Michael Mann, a great director. And then uh, you worked at Netflix. And how long did you work at Netflix? What division? And what did your job entail? Okay, well, first of all, let me make a minor correction. I was an agent, excuse me, at ICM, and I had different kinds of jobs at both William Morris and, and CAA. I was in the story department at CAA, and I was an agent trainee at William Morris. But uh, to answer your question, I was at Netflix for about three and a half years until about November of last year. I'm about to take a very similar job at another big streamer, um, which is going to be almost the same, but also different in some respects, because I think their mandate's a little bit different. And uh, it was the perfect job for me because I got I get to work remotely. I'm living in Mexico right now, and uh, Netflix is very much a sort of very fit it fits in for people like me who are sort of I, I guess digital nomad types. I think that's very encouraging things for our students too because a lot of them are international. They can always get a visa after that. And it's actually very good news. So you can work for streamers and other people like that remotely. So um, what division did you work at? Netflix? Oh, I forgot about that part of your question. I worked in a division, it was called the Original Independent Film Division, which um, was is, is kind of like their smaller scale, more intimate movies. Sometimes they have more of a kind of indie spirit sort of flair to them. They tend to be more character-based dramas. And I guess, I guess the other way they distinguish them is being different from the studio kind of tentpole, star-driven kind of movies. So the movies that would be branded more as Netflix originals, I guess. Okay. And what did your job entail? Well, it was very simple. I mean, I, I was... A, you know, I don't, I don't remember exactly what the title is. They're not big on titles. I was a story analyst, a reader. I would be kind of one of the first uh, nets of incoming material that came in from the outside world from largely through agents or management companies or, or largely producers and assess this material, write up a quick little report in kind of Netflix language in a way that they could conceptualize what the project is very concisely. And, and then, you know, offering a, a kind of quick market analysis in the comments, you know, how this fits in with the programming, why this works, why it doesn't work, why the packaging elements might be worth, you know, considering or not, that, that kind of thing. So I, I guess I would be kind of like the first line of defense, very minor cog in the wheel. <laughs> but a very important one. Well, so, like um, so, okay. And uh, how many script approximately did you have to read a week? And how many of them kind of make it as exceptional or ready to go? Well, when you're asking for Netflix, you're gonna get a very skewed answer because you're gonna get really real low statistics because they have a very high bar. And I would read, mm, I don't know, at least, 12 scripts a week, I guess, something something like that, or maybe not quite that many occasional books and so forth. And I also have other clients for whom I do, do this kind of consultation work. Uh, but for Netflix, very few of them make, make the bar. They, it's, it's a very binary process. It's not, it's not consider, it's not pass, you know, consider with reservations or revisions, it's pass or fail. And the consider just gets pushed up to the totem pole one one notch beyond that. 
But even just getting past me is a huge hurdle to overcome in terms yes. of the quality bar. Okay, so when, um, I mean, one of the complaints about Netflix is that they have too much content. I asked Ted Sarandos when I did the Q&A with, with him about that. And he said, because he comes from the world of DVD, you know, and the DVD stores. And he said that you have to basically cater to the different tastes of the consumer. So when you start reading for them, what was the mandate that they gave you other than quality? You know, that's, that's such a good question. And it's so difficult to answer. And it's kind of like, you know, that there's, there's a little bit of art to this that you've got to kind of figure out a little bit of, you've got to get in touch with the Netflix version of the zeitgeist. And they don't really do a good job of articulating what that is. You, you, you kind of have to figure it out on your own. And the way I understand it is a little bit what I was talking about before. I think there's an emphasis on a smaller scale to the projects, a, a greater degree of intimacy that, that brings the, the viewer into, into the depth of the experience. And it's different. You and I were talking before about a Marvel movie, for example. That's an example of a movie you go to a, a big theater to see with 300 other people. And there's Dolby Sound and there's THX and blah, blah, blah. And it's like a communal experience. Netflix isn't made for a communal experience. It's made for, you know, sitting alone in your bedroom or with your, your partner. And, you know, sometimes you're jacked in with your headphones. It makes for a different kind of movie. So you just kind of get tuned to a slightly different concept of what movies are in the, you know, this generation, this, this, this reality. Do they have a different kind of algorithm and language to say what their mandate is? Um, they probably do. I think they have all kinds of algorithms. The problem is they don't share them with anybody else other than the inner cabal that, that runs Netflix. Okay, but, but you but, have said, okay, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I think one clue I get is when I'm a, when I look at Netflix like a shopper, like a like I'm a I'm a consumer, and I see how they describe their project products to me when I'm trying to decide what to watch, and they don't describe it as so much as a genre like a romantic comedy or a horror movie. They use all these other kind of weird touchy feely adjectives like it's offbeat or it's cerebral or it's a slow burn or it's passionate. You know things that are about the mood that that movie is going to evoke or work with almost like a, almost like I'm curating a musical experience like what am I going to listen to when I come home from work wow oh, that's interesting uh, because in the studios where you and I came from it was always about you know the concept about all you know at a certain point so do you think that students need to be really very involved uh, in, in knowing all that, ex, you know, extensive business intelligence for them, or is it all about other stuff, quality well, for the writers? Well, I think it's good to, to, to keep an eye. I mean, I'm not a businessman at all. I'm terrible at business, but I love reading the trades and seeing who's making deals with with what studios and who Netflix is making overall deals with, because that really tells you something about where things are heading. And these are the companies that are out there that are gonna be flush with new money, with brand spanking new development executives who are gonna be wanting to build a slate of, of material and they've, they've got some development funds to spend. And they don't wanna be beholden to the same agents that, that everybody else is, you know, when they're calling up every weekend about weekend read. You know, you've done that. You know what that's like. You're fighting off every other development executive in town for, for what the agents are going out with that weekend. So, you know, you, you want to you wanna find people that are hungry, that, are, that uh, you know, want to get out of that loop a little bit. Um, before I start to you about what makes a writer distinguishable, which I really want to talk to you, because I think that um, that is something that 
would be very important to every writer. Tell me a little bit about the different divisions at Netflix, because it seems confusing if you're not there, because there is, um, there is basically original, but higher budget. There's original, the division that you work with, which is almost like films for festivals. Um, you know, then there's the series and there's, you know, so what are the different divisions? Well, <laughs> that, that is a very complicated question. I cannot answer that. And I don't think, I, I think it's meant purposely not to be answerable. Yes. The division I was in, yeah, they did do those kind of indie art films, but also they would be happily do a, a Blumhouse horror movie, something that just had a little bit of an extra spark to it, a little bit of an off kilter way of playing with genres. They'd be happy to do a romantic comedy. You know, it's, it's kind of the, the slant of the movie in a way. It's not typical studio fair because it's not a typical genre way of seeing it, the formula, but you can play with the genres. You can do hybrid genres. You can mix genres. That's all fine. I think that's kind of part of the Netflix formula a little bit. And, you know, writers that do something a little different that have a little bit of a quirk. And so, um, so what would you say by reading all those scripts that get submitted, what makes one writer distinguishable from the rest of them? What is it about those scripts that come in that pop up? Again, a very a great question, a very difficult one to put like specifics to. One thing is like, you know, the great, the great buzzword everybody talks about diversity. You know, diversity means a lot of diverse things. It's, it's not just, you know, having characters that are people of different cultural backgrounds and skin color and ethnicity and, or, or, or sexual orientation. It's about characters that literally see the world differently, like presenting that on screen. You see that in CODA, you know, characters that, that have a different way of literally communicating. That way of communicating literally informs a different way that they see and comprehend the world. If you find a way to put that down on the screenplay, that kind of diversity, you know, the diversity that goes beyond those, those skin level things. You know, think of, or here's, a, here's even a more, a, a, more, a more commercial example, like um, that, that Ben Affleck movie, The Accountant. You know, it wasn't just the thriller because his character also was autistic and wasn't, you know, had, a, had an off kilter way of seeing the world. So you're giving the audience a thriller that has a character that sees the world differently for the purposes of that genre. You know, writers that do something like that think slightly out of the box, but with elements that are comfortable and familiar, that gets noticed by Netflix. And, and I think I'll, I'll, all, the, all the buyers out there these days, that kind of thing. So give a little bit of a twist to the genre, come at it in a, maybe a different way. Something. Yeah, I, I don't think they're looking necessarily to reinvent the wheel, but they want to, you know, to have the wheel be a different color, a different concept behind it, a little jive. You know, even though this wasn't a Netflix movie, I mean, I love some of the Blumhouse movies. I used to be a big horror fan, but the remake that they did of The Invisible Man I thought that that was a brilliant way to reconceive the genre because the original take on that, it's the movie from Claude Rains's, you know, the invisible man's point of view. It's all of the kind of fun, you know, adolescent boy fantasy of being invisible and getting to, you know, sneak, sneak into the girl's locker room. But it became a very different movie when it was told from the victim's point of view. And she's stopped by this invisible, you know, presence that, Maybe she's crazy because other people can't see this. You know, the audience can only see it sometimes when we inhabit her, her POV. So it becomes a very different kind of movie. It's, it's not, you know, it's not the execution. It's the concept of the idea that I think makes it a more contemporary feeling movie for, for what's market is, what the market. I agree. It used to be that it was harder to do something like that. But now when you have all the streamers and all the opportunities and people are seeing from home and you don't have to get them to the theater and spend millions of dollars of, um, you know, marketing, uh, there's so much room for those things. And those are usually 
you know, the good ones. So yeah, <laughs> you know, they pay off at the end. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Well, now I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned before, you know, some about, you know, a criticism, I guess, of, of Netflix that they have too much product. And I'm going, wow, like, how's that? How's that a criticism? You know, how's that something that you have to defend? That seems like, like a good well, thing to me. Yes. No, I think a lot of people were saying that there's so much that sometimes you don't even know what to choose or you don't know enough about those movies or a series to want to choose. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah so, I, I, I don't know. Maybe other people have different experiences, but gosh, we just went through a two year long pandemic. I mean, I know I watch more shows than most people, but I, I found myself like like running dry of, of new things. To well, watch that was, anything. yeah, there was a lot of it was before the pandemic, really. I heard that more than, you know, before. Yeah. But, you know, the head of content at Netflix, Ted Sarandos, he came, he started to work as a student in the DVD store. In a DVD store, you could just go on the different shelf and different, you know, and it had everything. And so that was the concept really about, you know, Netflix. And some people were, you know, it was hard for them to see, you know, the trees yeah. from the forest, the forest from the tree. Um, so how much development does um, Netflix do? If any? As far as I can tell, they don't they do little to, to absolutely none. I just don't think they're set up that way. And I know that what I was encouraged to look for was stuff that was that was already pretty much developed and actually was packaged with stars and filmmakers and, and sometimes even budgeted out. I think that they, my, my take on it and other people could, could perceive of it differently, but I think they almost outsource development to producing companies, you know, to the Shonda Rhimes, the David Kellys, the, you know, the, the, the bad robots, because, um, you know, and these people know how to speak the language, they know what product works and uh, they give it, they, they, you know, give it to them almost polished. Yes. Well, that's good, but the advice about the writers doesn't matter because uh, whether it goes directly to, oh, you said something and then we'll go to the student. Um, because let's say that the writers don't have direct access to um, the Netflix executive to pitch, you said something about that they should then um, basically pitch in terms of comps. What, do, what did you mean by that? Well, I, I just think that, that comps is part of the vernacular. That's the language that executives and agents and people in development in the business use to describe projects to one another. And it's not always so much about the story elements itself, but it's the kind of movie it is. Like it's this meets that type of thing. But I, I guess what I'm saying is about, I, I don't think the Netflix is not meant to be a public facing, you know, screener of talent. They don't wanna hear from the public. They don't wanna hear from film school students or amateur screenwriters trying to break in. They wanna be, they wanna be introduced to writers that have already been discovered by producers. Those are the people that are gonna be a little bit more in the trenches and willing to find a project that, you know, 60 70 percent there and need some work before it's ready to go to netflix I understand. down the road i understand yeah. and i'm sure the student are going to ask a lot of questions about how to get to that spot but in order to get to that spot they have to write a great screenplay that somehow is distinguishable that has some of the qualities that you have talked about um, get into a project in a kind of a different way, uh, have a genre, but inter, you know, focusing on the different character and so on and so forth. I just was curious then, what do you mean by Compt? Is it just this movie is like um, the Ben Affleck movie? This movie is like uh, David Kelly legal thriller. Oh. Is that what you mean? Or is it 
the structure, the tone, the, the scale. It's, it's all of the above, I guess. If, if there's a signature element to the movie that distinguishes it, a la, for example, the twist in the sixth sense, then you would use like, a you would use that as the, the keyword. Okay, the sixth sense. So it's gonna have this amazing twist ending that's gonna make us reconceive of the whole movie we've just watched meets the Helen Keller story. I mean, that's a ridiculous example, but that's, you know, comps. Or, you know, just to kind of, two or three counter examples that will bring out the key nuances that distinguish whatever that signature, whatever the secret sauce of that project is. Okay, so let's open up for students. Mike, do we have questions? We do, we have a question here from Miguel de Campo. Miguel, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. Uh, thank you very much for um, this interview. It's it's been very interesting. Um, my question could be, uh, well, I think you already answered this, but I just want to ask again, Case, uh, what would you recommend for people who want to start pitching projects to producer or streaming companies? And what's the most important thing that the producers or streaming companies are looking for in, in new filmmakers? Uh well, wow, that's that's I, I guess I answered it a little bit, but yeah, I, let's let's dig into that. Um, they're looking for an original voice. I mean, for writers that are doing something that is unique to them. And you know, the old cliche that everyone hears in film school or any writing school for that matter is write what you know. And I think that if you're a, a, a newer screenwriter trying to get into the business, you know, pick your lane and pick a lane that's navigable. I think you're much better off if you want to learn, you know, skiing, you start on the bunny hills and you conquer those. You don't kind of get okay on the bunny hills and then go immediately to the Black Diamond Run and start trying to write a big multifaceted musical or a big movie born, born identity uh, uh, espionage piece with a lot of datelines and different locations and a, a host of different characters. I think the, you know, do that, Wait until you kind of make your mark before you aim that high is, I think, always good advice. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, you can still find the unusual within the usual. Yeah. A absolutely. I think some of the most interesting movies right now are made on Netflix on a very intimate scale. They're digging deeper into the characters and, you know, making bigger plot moments and, and mining greater drama out of smaller moments of life rather than having a lot of car chases and, and special effects because you know great it's a different kind Next of question experience. mike yeah we have a question here from marcella camarota marcello we've enabled you to unmute yourself what is your question for michael hi well thank you for giving me the voice <laughs> uh, michael i got a question uh, you say okay um, if uh, supposedly if the script is great. Uh, it's all you've been looking for. Uh, do I need to give you also uh, some uh, financial packaging, some production uh, values or something like that? Or just with, with a screen, we can start to develop the idea? Well, that's, I, I'm not sure in what capacity you're asking me that question, because I mean, I am not at all um, you know, speaking as a as <clears throat> representative of Netflix, and I think they're agnostic to whether a, a movie is coming with any packaging or financing or anything like that. If if they like it, their their attitude is they're going to pay what they need to pay to get it. Uh, I don't think it's something you really need to worry about, as you know, unless you're going to be a producer or the the director of this and, and intimately involved with with that process. Leave that to the producers. Um, you know, they'll figure out. You know, okay. all of all of that stuff will take kind of take care okay. of itself. Okay, so so what you're saying is that uh, if the screenplay is is great, the producers of Netflix are going to develop uh, the the packaging and everything to to make that yeah, idea. I, I mean, I I guess that's a little bit of a of a simplified way of saying it, but I I got to tell you, I mean. I believe in the law of attraction or whatever you want to call it. Good material does find a way of getting made and people who, who like it. 
And, uh, you know, I've just seen it happen in real life time and time again through a pretty long checkered career. <laughs> well, thank you. That, that, that gives uh, people hope. Thank you for right. answering. Well, because it's 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 the real deal, and I bet I bet you Toba can attest to that also. We have a question here from Laura Hurtado Gomez. Laura, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Oh, hi. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Toba for bringing Michael uh, to NIFA. I had the pleasure to see all these conversations and these Q and A's. Uh, life when I was at NIFA, I'm an alumni. And I wanted to ask about uh, international productions, uh, considering that most of us are internationals. And what do you think it's that uh, formula, that attractive factor in a country for Netflix to want to produce something abroad the US? Wow, that, that is such a great question. I wish I knew a lot more about that because I think it's really exciting. Um, just this whole multiculturalism that we see on Netflix. And I don't know if it's just my feed or everybody's like this, you know, based on what I like to watch, but I get all of this, this international programming these days. And I noticed that even shows that, that I like to watch, and I'm sure a lot of you guys watch like Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, They'll have long sequences that are in Spanish with subtitles these days. I mean, it's it's almost like we're watching bilingual movies and the dubbing technology has gotten so amazing that that it's almost seamless. And uh, I, I think it's creating just this just landscape of, of abundance that's that's really um, creating interesting effects for the whole, you know, for what we can watch and what's what's offered to us. On. So <laughs> that's a long winded way. Uh, of saying, you know, I think I think it all fits in with the diversity program also, different points of view. It doesn't have to all be English dominated by, you know, white Western male patriarchal culture every day, all the, all the time. You can have projects that have a lot more cultural texture. So I hope that answers the question to some extent. Amazing, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Jacqueline Powell. Jacqueline, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Um, my question is, uh, the, the industry standard, quote unquote, is that you <clears throat> do not use a TV series as a comp for a movie. <clears throat> However, the two movies that are, are the two projects that are the closest to my film are uh, The Firm and Person of Interest. And um, there, it's actually a perfect blend and the script even has room for a TV series should that happen. Is it, <clears throat> it, do you subscribe to the, oh, never use a TV series as a comp for a movie? Um, no, I, I, I mean, I, I don't believe in, in taking those kind of like aphorisms seriously at all or those, those rules. I, I think just make sure that that the comps you're using are going to be the same audience or that there's going to be some like ironic meaning between joining the two of them together that's going to make sense. And by ironic, I don't necessarily just mean comedic. I mean that, it, you know, that yes. it's filling out the picture. And yes. in that case, I don't know, persons of a person of interest. And I'm, what was the, oh, the, the firm? Uh, the firm. Yeah, I mean, those are probably close enough, but they're a little bit of a stretch. And I think maybe the difference with television shows, you know, stay away from series because that's a different kind of conceptual story structure. But if it's if it's an, you know, I mean, I mean, episodic series like Law and Order or something right, like that right. doesn't make sense. But which is the the theme the theme of a person of interest and the uh, some of the issues of person of interest are at the heart of the movie. And also the character is most like Tom Cruise in the firm and, and, and is most like in that situation. And there are some of the other films that might be comparable, but they're so old that I don't want some 30 year old producer going, what? Yeah, well, look, to be, honest with, you, to be honest with you, if you and I, if you and I brainstormed for 10 minutes, we'd probably come up with a better list of comps than that. But I don't think I don't think yours is terrible. You know, I get the idea. But, you know, there probably would be something that would be a little bit more grabby and attention uh, awakening. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
What's a person of interest? What movie? Okay. That t- that's the TV show. TV show. Yeah, it was like one of those cyber thrillery kind of TV I shows. See. I don't remember it that well, but okay. I get the idea. Okay, next question, please. Yes, we have a question here from Beatrice Santa Maria Pena. Beatrice, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Hello, hi, how are you? Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, my question is, since we are in an age where people are consuming media really fast, uh, how does the number of pages in a screenplay influence if you're going to choose it or not? Um, not? Not really. It's not so no, much not the number really. of pages because, you know, people do use different typefaces and stuff. And I know that that on screenwriting forums, people get really hung up on formatting and typefacing and whatever. I don't think people really care that much. It just needs to have the right flow. I mean, I know that, you know, on the on the end of a weekend, I that, pardon me, oh. you know, at the end of the weekend, when I have a lot of scripts to read, I don't like to read scripts that have a lot of blocky blackness in them. I like a lot of white space, you know, I like it to have more visual flow. It helps me get into the the mood, the flow of the screenplay a little bit better, but page count, you know, you just get a sense after you've read enough. You 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 know how long the movie's lasting by by the reading experience. That's great. Thanks so much. Sure. Uh, we have another question here. Um, this one's from Yassine Kaptan. What should acquisitions expect from a script in the first 11 pages, other than the basics of an amazing inciting incident? and design principle. Well, that's a pretty good start, I guess. Again, it's one of those questions that's really hard to answer with specifics because you know when you've been doing this for a while, you just kind of see it or you don't see it. But it's pretty easy to read just five pages of a script and see whether the writer has some extra kind of grit or something or not, if they kind of are presenting the world in a little bit different way, that's that's different. You have to remember somebody like me, I mean, even you guys, I know you've, you've seen everything there is to watch out there. And I have also, but I've also read the 99 also rounds that didn't made it to that point, you know, all the little twists and turns of that genre, all of the different ways of playing with those same elements. And all these other executives have read them also. So, so to surprise me and get me to think and look a little bit new is hard to do, but you can kind of get that just the way the, the, the writer uses words, the way that he, see, he or she sees cinematically, you know, it just, you, you get a feel for it. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question here from Angelo Rocha. Angelo, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Yeah, hi, Mike. Um, what would you say is the biggest telltale sign that a screenwriter is not ready for the big leagues. Even if the idea is a fantastic idea and you read the first 10 pages and possibly even the last 10 pages, what is your biggest telltale sign that the screenwriter is just not ready? Well, I don't have, I have, I don't know if I have any one big telltale sign. You can just kind of tell that, you know, from the overall presentation. I mean, everybody has a job that they're good at and knows like they're an expert at better than anyone else in the world. And you can just see the second best by just looking at it. I mean, that's how it works with the screenplay. Um, The writing and the execution is one thing. The movie that the project is trying to tell is another. And they both have to be working to one degree or another. I mean, I read a lot of times perfectly well executed screenplays, very competently written. Some of them have, have won, you know, all these top contests. But I'm like, okay, great, you know, an agent in, or a manager, in my in my opinion, is not going to be excited by a lot of those because they've already got a list of a, a lot of middle rank clients that they're struggling to get work for. And every time there's an open writing assignment, it's like the same six or twelve names over and over again. Nobody wants to add another one, another writer to the middle rank. So there's got to be a, a, a secret style here, and that's why Netflix. What, what Tova was describing before about too much offering is good for all of you guys because you might all have little quirky, weird, narrow little stories based on your own experience that somebody out there is going to want to watch. So tell those stories. It's going to be easier for you to write. You're going to be able to knock that one out of the park a lot easier. 
And you're not going to be just another guy writing the same old genre or guy or, or woman writing the same old, um, you know, genre stuff because they don't want that anymore. It just, you know, there's a lot of guys that can just do that. It's the, it's the extra stuff that, that uh, everyone's looking for, whether they're agents, managers, or, or, or Netflix drones. It's not every day that I get to talk to a guy like Michael Schumann uh, that I follow everywhere, just about everywhere you go. And uh, what you two were talking about with Netflix is absolutely correct. I think Netflix has been a godsend for people like me, people who can actually have movies that are kind of weird and have high concepts and weird alien stuff and just absolutely mind boggling, you know, yeah. imagination. And Netflix just makes it happen. I mean, for my money, Netflix has figured out with the obvious lesson that, you know, a lot of the other streamers haven't haven't really fully learned yet. They're not selling movie tickets. They're selling subscriptions. They can be do very well hitting base hit after base hit and finding an audience and driving engagement. And every once in a while, one of these little base hits is going to explode on them. In the meantime, they get to be everything to everyone and offer, you know, globalization, different languages. You know, it's uh, it it you know it doesn't entirely work, obviously, because they lost. Yes, we just saw them lose thirty three percent in market value two weeks ago. But certainly, the concept sounds pretty good to me. I highly agree. Thank you so much, Mike. Sure. I have to add that when I was reading scripts all the time, and I read very slowly. I really didn't want to have off the top, I didn't want to have a lot of descriptions and a lot of exposition. The less of them, the more engaged I got right from the beginning. Jump into it is what I would have loved to see. Yeah, I, I love the experience of feeling like the movie, like I'm not reading a book. I'm literally like feeling a movie unfold in my head by very few sparse little cues that the writer has, has curated for me to create this world through a character's point of view. Now, I know that sounds very abstract, but that's what writing is. You know, it's not just writing pretty, pretty words next to one another. No, it's just getting you right in instead of a lot of description and exposition and exposition in dialogue and so on and so forth. To me, that's a tall tale right from the beginning that I'm just, you know, that it's, not for me, basically. I, I totally agree. I love it when when it's almost like the words disappear and the page just becomes transparent. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, what's the next question? Uh, we have a question here from Boise Esqueda. Boise, we've enabled you, you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Hi, Michael, and thank you for being with us. Uh, my question is, um, how, do, uh, how does having a, let's say having an established uh, manager and or say a, a first feature credit under your belt factor into getting your script uh, read by someone at Netflix. Is that gonna make things easier? Or is that gonna be, uh, I just wanna know how those things could uh, factor in, in as far as getting to that point. Yeah, I mean, certainly having credits or having produced, certainly produced credits is, is obviously a boon. But I still, I still feel like there's a big misconception out there about you, Boise, taking your project to Netflix. I don't think that's what they're set up for. I don't think they want to hear from you, you know, produce screenwriter or not. I think they want to hear from from J.J. Uh, uh, Abrams' company, Mad Robot, bringing you Boise's script that they've packaged with, you know, stars and you know have have kind of like put through their processing plant first. I, I <clears throat> so. Um, you know, the way that, you know, obviously the more success you have, the better you're going to be at doing all of this. You're going to know a lot more of the ropes, but I still think that, you know, Netflix or all of the streamers for that matter, it's an institutional business to business play. It's not, it's not a public facing retail business. So let's just say, let's just say that somebody like that comes up a writer is writing a screenplay. Uh, it's very excited about it. He does the comp. He does this great presentation. And then should he think about 
who are the producers that do that kind of material and try to reach them? Is yes, that yes, that's, that's exactly it. That's, that's the key to the comps. It's not so much about describing your project to other people in my mind. It's about understanding your project itself because producers have taste. They have sensibility that's kind of definable. Agents and managers are by and large more or less agnostic. I mean, they want product that they can sell in the marketplace, but they're not personally involved with it the same way producers would be who live with these things and want something to say. So, so when you think, when it, in comps, I mean, what kind of movie? Is it a female-oriented movie? Is it LGBTQ? Is it a thriller? You find the producers who are already working for Netflix and the streamers in the studios who have a reputation, who've identified themselves as making that kind of project. If you're doing a certain kind of uh, um, contemporary horror movie, you go to Blumhouse. That, those are the guys that make that, obviously. You're probably not going to bring them... Um, a, a, a musical. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of comps. You figure out producers that have creative producers that have the same taste. Those are the people that you're probably going to find, you know, kindred spirit, be kindred spirits with creatively. Yeah. And try to be friendly with the assistant. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because nobody's just an assistant in, in Hollywood. They're all assistants that want to be, you know, their bosses and their bosses' bosses. And so they, they want to find a way to, you know, they're hungry sometimes. Well, I think when I was uh, really an assistant, let's say to producers, if I, I remember reading Chris Columbus for a script, you know, and reading um, other people that, you know, it would behoove me to run to my boss and say, listen, I just read this great script. You have to read it. Absolutely. So you're not going to get to the big boss, but you're going to get to the assistant and empower him or her, you know, and let them do the work for you and introduce you. That's another way to get to those production houses. Not only is it another way, it's like the best and almost arguably the only way because people do things with you when there's something, you know, unfortunately, it's human nature when there's something in it for them. If they've got an exciting new writer that they can, you know, use as their banner to get noticed, you know, that's an ally you want to have in your court. Great. Okay, next question. We have a question here from Daria Markova. Daria, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Mm, hello. Uh, so Squid Game was declined by networks for years and then finally accepted by Netflix. So my question is, is there sometimes a certain period of time and place for certain scripts, or you should you just need to keep pushing no matter what if you believe in your idea? Well, um, I that, didn't know the Squid Game was. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't either. But yeah, there's definitely a time and the place. But there's also, and and yeah, there's there's something to be said for keeping to push if you really believe in it. But. I think there's also such a thing as as delusion. So you you have to you have to be able to balance balance the, or understand the difference between the two. And in the case with Squid Game, I'm wondering whether that was the the sole creator who was banging their head up against the wall trying to find somebody who got it, or if there was a production company. I mean, maybe a good sign is if you're onto something that's worth fighting for. If you've got other people who you know, know what they're doing and have some, some stature behind him that, that also buy into this, this mad dream. Otherwise, you know, maybe it's a good idea to rethink, uh, you know, think, think, switch to plan B. Sometimes, sometimes it's uh, also very good to bring, you try a different element. I made a movie at, you know, at Paramount that two other executives turned down and then I brought a different director and it went to another executive and over the weekend it became a greenlit movie. The same studio that turned it down. So sometimes you have to think about what other element can I bring that would make them all excited and look again at it. Or, yeah. That's, that's true. And also, even at an earlier stage in the process, I know I do this, writers get myopic. They get locked into a rut, a certain way of thinking. 
And I think there's a real value to going outside and having brainstorming sessions with, you know, writers groups, or see, there's so many resources out there on the web these days for consultation services with real people that can read your script. And, you know, you got to spend a little bit of money, but you got to spend money for tennis lessons or piano lessons also to get yeah. your, you know, to get, to get beyond just being a good club player to the pro ranks. I mean, you know, there's, there's an investment that makes sense, you know, for your own educational purposes. And sometimes a, a read that's not your, your aunt who interned at Condé Nast after she graduated from Bryn Mawr isn't going to give you the same, you know, read on your, on your screenplay and maybe an idea for really making it a, a lot different and making, you know, something that was just average really sizzle. That's just a, a slightly different way, a different focus or a different angle of approach. Yeah, because oh. sometimes just one idea sparks yeah. a whole different way of doing it. Yeah. Okay, let's hear um, another question. We have a question here from Ryan McCormick. Ryan, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Hey, Michael. Hey, Tova. Uh, thank you guys for jumping on. <clears throat> kind of uh, tailing a little bit on some of the questions you guys have already answered. But in terms of, uh, Michael, you had mentioned that just getting past you, uh, was a bit of a, <clears throat> a feat, right? I guess yeah. what would be some of the, some things to be wary of on our side or even some big red flags on your side that really did not get the people through the process? Well, I, I don't even really think about it as red flags so much because red flags implies that I'm really expecting to find something and I'm really not. It's, it's really kind of a filtering process. It's almost like just in case there's, there's something, a needle in the haystack here. So it's, it's I, I think what I see more than anything is stuff that's just okay. It's just kind of average. It doesn't, it, it's fine for the genre, but it doesn't, it's not a different kind of cinematic experience. It doesn't say anything new. It's not deep, it's dumb or, or just shallow. And, uh, um, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, or it's just not right for the current market. It just doesn't, it's, it's an old fashioned World War II movie, a, an old fashioned kind of storytelling. Somebody who, you know, I see a lot of scripts where I feel somebody just isn't sensitized to the fact that streamers are a different delivery system. It's a different experience of watching movies. They don't want a lot of narration. They don't want a lot of voiceovers. They don't want too many characters, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, appreciate you guys' time. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question here. This one's from Justin. Uh, Justin, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Michael? Hey, hello. Uh, thank you, Michael, for coming. Um, yeah, I just had a question. Uh, why does Netflix uh, cut some of their own series but picks up other network series that got cut. I've always wondered that. Um, you know, those, those, those kind of things, I have no idea. You know, it is, it is a faceless, opaque, opaque you know, it's indecipherable behemoth, the way that Netflix <laughs> makes decisions. And in terms of television, that's a whole other thing unto itself. Um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of it is done by bean counters. You know, they, they can figure out yeah. exactly what the profitability of something's going to be versus how much it's going to cost to acquire. And, uh, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of mystery to those guys with that, that kind of fair. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Do you think, do you think that um, you have to be kind of attuned a little bit? I think you said to the Zeitgeist like what is going on right now in society? What do you think that to be modern and not so much old fashioned, not just in the writing, uh, so in terms of the subject matter, you have to be kind of attuned to what's going on right now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think, look, I mean, regardless of what anybody's ideological point of view is, there's no de denying that the, the, there is a kind of like liberal progressive bent to the media and you see it in main, you know, in, in, in Netflix and a lot of other, you know, Hollywood style programming. And so 
I mean, take an issue like, I don't know, the LGBTQ, um, you know, issue. I think you'll see, you'll see a lot of those kind of characters, but in Netflix programming, what I'm seeing them is those kind of characters much more evolved and assimilated into society. They're not movies about like a young teenage kid coming out so much and struggling with those kind of identity issues, because that's, that's kind of a little bit passe. That's almost like more movie of the week. Yeah. These, are, these are trans characters and different kinds of diverse characters that are already in high you know, functioning roles of society and, and it's just accepted. So maybe that's one kind of example of that, that kind of trend that you know, makes sense to just get a feel for in the streamer universe, how they, how they deal with that kind of stuff. What, what would you say is the difference between, if there is one, between Netflix, HBO Max, Hulu, uh, Amazon, uh, and so on and so forth. Is there like, yeah. this mm -hmm. one does this, this one does this, this one does this, and therefore if I'm a writer, this is where I'm aiming. Well, or they probably- Or is it not that clear? It's, I, I don't know if it's really that clear, but I don't know if it's ever been that clear. I mean, when in our day, you know, all, this, all the studios used to try to distinguish themselves but it seems to me they were always bidding on the same material and you know they're pretty indistinguishable in terms of their programming. So um, what I have been told by Amazon Studios is, is very different though, that they wanna make more of a kind of you know, commercial, traditional Hollywood style movie. They like big stars. You know? they're, they're not so much that kind of indie character vibe as, as Netflix wants, is willing to embrace. They, they like bigger movies. Like there was a movie a little while ago on Netflix that to me almost seemed more like an Amazon Prime movie. It was called, I think it was called Red Notice with like Ryan exactly. Reynolds. And yeah, and that made a huge amount of, of money. Well, I don't even know if money is the right term to use in that context since it's right. Netflix, but it got a lot of buzz. It, it was very big success. That would yeah. be a, like more of an Amazon movie, I think. Yeah, Gal Gadot, Gal Gadot and, and uh, two other big stars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, Gil Gadot, those, right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty bad, I thought. But, but you know, that's the kind of movie that, you know, star-driven movies. I think Netflix actually probably has an interest to almost dismantling the star, the movie star system to some extent. They like a lot of mid-level stars, like like Greg Kinnear and, you know, Gillian Anderson and, and you know, Margaret Qualley type people because they're still, a, they're still good actors and an indicia of quality, but they're really cheap and uh, they can spread them out a lot easier. Yeah, and put all their uh, money in one thing. Yeah. And, and so what do you think is, now that Netflix had a setback, a serious setback, and what do you think is the future of the streamers? Where are they gonna go to get more money? Because the competition is so fierce um, and everybody, everybody um, wants a piece of it. I even read today in the LA Times that some of the smaller companies uh, that are for free, like Amazon has, TV or something, you know, yeah. people are doing that because they're willing to look at something with ads as long as it's free. What do you think studios like a Netflix or people like that are going to do? Amazon and Apple TV doesn't matter because they have giant business that are not dependent just on the movies, but the one that are just dependent on content for survival. Are they going to go, uh, you know, advertising, add gaming, add meta universe, sell their project to, to broadcasting, merge? What do you think, if any? Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a macro ec ec economist by any stretch of the imagination, and I don't understand the business models of any of these things. And Netflix or these companies, as, as far as I can tell, aren't very keen on sharing. But I, my <laughs> sense is, 
my sense is that, you know, a lot of the hit that happened to Netflix recently wasn't really having to do with the content so much. And I know that there are detractors, but I think the quality is pretty solid across the board. I mean, I don't like all of it. And I think there's, there's, there's direct like anything, but I think it's pretty darn consistent. And there's, there certainly is a lot of it. One of the things that surprised me is like, we've gotten along for so long. I mean, I don't know how many people, I've got two kids. I don't know how many people are sharing my subscription. I mean, they make it way too easy for people to have access to it as far as I can tell. And I think you know, some of their some of their profitability might have to do with issues that have nothing to do with content. Yeah, that they've got to address. I'm like Russia. Well, well, anyway, I have to say that uh, those streamers brought a lot of joy and entertainment, especially during the dark times. Yeah, <laughs> some of those programs were exceptional. Uh, I'm a squid game kind of girl. And, uh, you know, there were other programs that I just watched. And uh, so I think that um, the streamers are here to stay no matter what. I think that um, doing work, as you said, that is exceptional is very important. We had in the program here, Nancy Myers, and she said, you know, people think that uh, they write a script in a month. And she said, it takes me a year. I write and then I do a table read and then I get feedback and I go back. And basically by the time I'm done with the script, it's already perfect for the actors that I want because I tested it and tested and vetted and read. And she said, it takes a year for something that is really quality. So um, I think that, um, you know, quality comes from uh, a lot of people. I think you gave very good pointers. I thank you very much from uh, staying up because in Mexico it's already what nine o'clock. Only, only nine o'clock. <laughs> Time to go and watch one of those things. I'm not, 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 I'm not that old yet. <laughs> and um, thank you very much for coming and sharing from your experience. And um, I hope we see you again and uh, in your new job. I think, which we cannot say what it is, but you're going to be yep. at another streamer and we're looking forward to hear what's going on over there. Well, <laughs> great. And, you know, if anyone, you know, wants to get in touch with me, I, I do um, consulting with, with screenwriters on a site called Stage 32 and I'm on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, I, I don't always have time to respond to everybody, but, you know, I am kind of vaguely, of, and don't send me, you know, a bunch of pinches. I'm not going to send anything to Netflix or anyone else for you. I won't even consider it. So that's not what this is about, but you know, there, there, I do have a very small <laughs> presence out there, social presence. Well, well I think um, I thank you for sharing that with us. I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in that. I think that you cannot have enough um, help with navigation and advice from somebody who's experienced it for many, many years. And once again, I want to say thank you for coming. And helping. well, thank you for having me, Tova. It's been great uh, reconnecting with you after after so much time. <laughs> we knew each other. I don't even want to say how many years. Thank you again. Thank bye you. Bye.